نحمده و نصلي على رسول الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it's just gone 7 min- uh, 13 minutes past 7 on a monday evening if it's a monday evening it's the business matters program on radio alansar yes stay tuned to radio alansar you would me anwar mulla for the next uh, 45 minutes or so and we talking artificial intelligence more specifically we're talking about legal implications of artificial intelligence content creation yes it's good to be in the studio after a long 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 break i think i last spoke to you the week after or after ramadan and then i've been away traveling to all parts of the world um and now back in sunny durban best place to be for the winter and back on the air of radio lansar so lovely to be back in the studio and to join you once again on the business matters program tonight my guest uh, is telephonic um she's a person who's um, with an, an a firm of attorneys called BPG Attorneys her name is Nazneen Khan and assalamu alaikum and welcome to Radio Lansar uh, Nazneen Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakallah for having me it's also been a really long time since I've been on radio uh, <laughs> so just a little bit nervous as well Nazneen uh, thanks for joining us uh, welcome to Radio Lansar and uh, tell us which part of the country are you joining us from I'm based in Pretoria but originally from KZN so I am a KZN girl Okay and uh, been in Pretoria for how long now Um from last year May so you could say just over a year Okay Nazneen uh, uh, did you study in 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 KZN Yes, uh I did my degree through UNISA. I did my PLT through UKZN and um yeah, I did several things after that. Okay. Lovely to have you on air. Uh we're talking artificial yeah. intelligence and all things artificial intelligence. Um artificial Great. intelligence is a buzzword at the moment. Um you know, look at mm-hmm. some companies on the international stock exchange like Nvidia. and they've kind of hitting yeah. the ball out of the park in terms of their share price all on the back of artificial intelligence and what's to come who knows i mean it's something that's that's quite new to to us but uh, in a few years time something that i'm sure would be um as uh, as easy as as or, or or something that we would use daily like we use yeah. whatsapp and all of the other social media tools so tell us a little bit about artificial mm-hmm. intelligence and what is artificial intelligence before we we get into the nitty gritty of the legal implications of artificial intelligence so i think um a tech expert can basically explain basically explain the the complete um dynamics of artificial intelligence i think it's something that's constantly changing i think that it's something that we're uh, understanding more and more of each and every day um although it appears new artificial intelligence is obviously over a number of years being developed and um this is something that makes it possible you know for machines to learn from experience adjust to new inputs and you know perform human like tasks as if it were a human itself so it's given a human personality um obviously Obviously, the word intelligence plays an important role in the actual aspect of it because um, it does a little bit more at a faster pace than actual humans. So it's a little bit scary at the same time, but like changing circumstances, changing trends uh, in our society, it's something that we need to keep up with because I think although we were scared, um, you know, everybody said uh, jobs are going to become obsolete, attorneys are going to become obsolete and those kind of things. But it's here to stay. We need to acknowledge it. We need to embrace it. And I think um, ultimately we need to find ways to work with it in our industry. so we do not become obsolete yes i think uh, even if you go on to whatsapp now and if you type in you know they've got a bit of arti- artificial intelligence in a yeah. very primary way you type in something or something that you want to search and it will give you a whole uh, write up on um on on that uh, subject matter whatever it is i was quite amazed i i tried it a few times and uh, it comes up almost yeah. instantly and it gives you very very accurate information on the subject matter 
Yeah, even LinkedIn. Um, now you can, if you're unsure how to, you know, create content on LinkedIn, there's a process where you can just type in whatever you want and then it will rephrase it in a more professional manner for you in order to post. So I think that's something that's actually also really, really nice. So are you attorneys getting uh, a little bit afraid that the, the world of artificial intelligence is going to take over your, your profession? <laughs> Well, of course, I think everybody is afraid. Um, but I think, like I said earlier, we need to try and work with it and work it into what we already do so that we actually don't become obsolete. I mean, right now in America, there's going to be the first uh, robot lawyer to represent somebody. Wow. And um, if if an, if a bot can actually process information from different legislation, it's a scary thought because attorneys can process things they can process things fast, but I mean, sometimes it takes a little bit of time I'm and just, research. I'm just thinking ahead and thinking about the day when the judge may be a bot and, and now you're speaking to this bot and you're put, presenting your case and the bot is going to be pre- uh, giving you a, a passing judgment on the case. You should think that's a bit far-fetched. Yeah. I don't think it's far-fetched at all because like I said, um, you know, the first bot to represent somebody in America, they have legislation literally being processed at a very, very fast rate. But I think, um, you know, if you talk about some of the primary legal challenges that are currently associated with AI, um, one of the things to consider is a much talked about aspect of the challenge of AI is the bias. Mm-hmm. So. I think that's something that needs to be overcome. And I think it's going to be many, many, many years before that actually happens because AI process information in sometimes a discriminatory way, depending on how it's produced or how it's designed. So I think we are a long way still away. Okay. I hope we are actually. Um, um, Okay. So let's talk about some of the the primary legal challenges you alluded to. Um, Mm -hmm. What are some of these primary legal challenges associated with the use of AI? Um, So there there are really so many. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, describe a few and then I'll go into some of the details of it. So I think the first and foremost thing that we need to say here is that AI, despite being in development, like I said earlier and talked about and being tested over a number of years, it's really only between last year and this year that the various industries have really incorporated it you know, into practice. And in saying this, we have to firstly highlight the fact that there is no current legislation specifically designed to regulate AI, okay. especially considering the fact that you know challenges that come with the utilization of AI being very new, still being identified, and like in a legislation, I said, will take a little bit of time before we can have them implemented uh, to deal with these challenges. So some of these challenges include things like, you know, the IP laws, um, trademarks, copyright, um, uh, data privacy, ethical considerations, the bias that I just spoke about. So, you know, if we have to go into something, for example, the intellectual property aspect right. or patent aspect. Uh, now, I'm not an IP attorney, so I'm not going to really, you know, delve into the IP legislation per se, but just generally speaking, if you are a graphic designer, for example, or an attorney, the work you create is your intellectual property. So this graphic or this legal opinion um, or any of the art is generated by you and owned by you. So then there's the issue as to, you know, ownership of the content that's created by AI. Who owns that creative property since it's not designed by you? And then can this be distributed without infringing any intellectual property laws? And and then the other thing is, if you have to sue based on infringement, how would you prove or rely on such ownership of intellectual property? You know, Um, and then the other concern with regards to copyright is, say, you're designing your own bot for for use of a specific purpose, because that's become common now. Um, Everybody wants to design their own bots for different things, you know, in their companies, for example, virtual secretaries, that kind of a thing. So you designed an app through your own skill or idea. Right. This idea can obviously be trademarked. Now with AI, most people use existing AI backing programs, such as ChatGPT or other AI programs to create like a different model to suit their specific needs. So then the question comes in, 
who owns that model if that structure of that model is founded on artificial intelligence programs that's already been designed by someone else or it's already been created by someone else right. how do you trademark something and legitimately say that you know you have full rights to it or where in law can you find this so i think that's something that's that's very challenging then um another primary legal challenge we could say is uh, data privacy that's very important um that's something that we need to carefully consider for the future of ai as well because uh these relate to things like attorneys um not only attorneys even other companies who process data or process you know personal information there's legal and there's ethical considerations to think about here um recently like you know attorneys they've been making use of ai to draft things or to input personal information and we need to be very careful here because firstly ai is constantly being monitored as you know to you know to improve bots so there's like this third party right. that's that's you know monitoring the bots meaning an attorney or a, another company should be very careful not to input personal information of clients into this bot especially without their without their permission um because this amounts to things like breach of privilege personal information um and therefore obviously an attorney's ethical duty so i would say that also this this amounts to a break a breach of legislation in terms of the copy act i'm sure everybody's heard of the copy act by now um it's something that people take for granted but it's very prevalent it's the per- protection of personal information act and uh, that's something that we we really need to keep in mind okay so how do current intellectual property laws for example apply to ai generated content and are there any proposed changes to these laws that are being tabled in terms of intellectual property um you know as i said earlier i'm not really a property attorney so i'm just going to speak very uh, very generally because i don't want to go into a ip legislation per se okay but i'll repeat what i said before uh, ai poses a lot of challenges in this respect with regard to ownership for example the copyright act and then you have the patent act so these acts if you look at the you know what they confer rights on they confer rights on people actual people natural persons and juristic persons so the act makes no provision for things like bots so things that are generated by um computer systems there's nothing in the act to grant ownership on that respect so the questions then come um who owns the property the ai bot the developer the user and if legislation is to be considered how will they determine this criteria on ownership okay so like uh, in the same regard the patent act the same thing the inventor is the natural person and once again same challenges ai is not a person so if we if we have to consider how ip laws such as the copyright act or the patent act applies to humans we see that copyright is conferred upon a person or a juristic entity for a list of things including art music um you know those kind of things and if anyone else had to create a similar content or the same things this infr- infringes upon their rights or the existing rights uh, of their ownership or their copyright and they can be penalized in terms of the legislation so with ai ai is not a person how do you punish ai who has the liability for this but you know having said this and uh, the answer to the second part of your question about the proposed changes um i would say yes the challenges of ai is obviously in, you know an international known fact and with the changing environment role players are obviously at task constantly to try and test these challenges that have come about and to develop appropriate legislation to deal with these challenges um for example the world intellectual property organization they're in constant discussion about this and obviously they're testing the challenges and once they've done this i think they would be able to provide guidance on how the laws would then be adapted to deal with all these challenges in terms of ai and that would then obviously be spread uh, over all the different countries and how their laws work they would have to adapt it into their system and i know some of these discussions for example um including included proposals for ai systems on who who uh, like for example ai being the co-creators um with either the user or the programmer being the rights holder um other talks included um 
patent uh, who who would the, who would be the inventor in terms of the patent would uh, that the AI would be the inventor but the rights would be you know the user or the developer so I think in summary I would say that as much as possible because we don't have any legislation we would have to see how our current IP laws address at least some of these challenges um, which I would say is, is wholly wholly insufficient and inadequate but um, as you know, we said earlier, AI is advancing at a very a fast pace. It is important for legislation to also be on par with this. And although, although there are discussions, and I think I will reiterate what I said again, is I think it's going to be some time before we have anything that's workable. Okay. What are the potential legal liabilities for, for companies using AI in decision-making processes, especially when these decisions lead to adverse outcomes? <laughs> um. I don't know if you heard about the attorney recently that used AI to draft the heads of arguments. I didn't, but you Did can you hear about it. Okay, so firstly, I'm not going to lie. Chat GPT can be really, really amazing. You know, when you have a mind block and you just want to draft something and you need an idea and, and you just want to input it into Chat GPT and then change it around, you know, to suit, you, suit yourself or suit what you need. Um, I would never rely on Chat GPT for legal information. And I'll tell you why. Right. Um, the experience of an attorney ha comes with a lot of challenges as well. So they, an attorney obviously has experience on different case law, uh, the experiences that they've had with certain circumstances, and they can apply this experience to different circumstances uh, that they faced in, in an industry. And that the same goes with other companies as well. Um, for example, they know the needs that need to go into different types of heads of arguments or opinion. Um, and I think that the expertise of an attorney is still very valuable and restricted to attorneys being in person. So what happened was this attorney used ChatGPT to draft the heads of argument. Right. They went to court um, and they, they basically, they said the heads of argument and uh, they had a specific case law that they used. So those who don't know what heads of argument it is, basically your, your argument in court when it comes to a matter and then you use case law that's previously decided cases to prove, to prove what you're trying to say. Right. So they couldn't find this case that this attorney obviously quoted and, um, after much uh, much thought and much uh, searching, it was discovered that ChatGPT completely, completely made up this case law in order to prove <laughs> the argument. Okay. It was completely made up and it was so bad. And I know because I tried something uh, not similar, not in terms of my heads of argument, I tested this theory because I asked for a legal, um, I asked a, a ChatGPT to summarize a particular case law and it made up a completely different case. And this is actually bad. So, the question we can then ask in this regard is, is, is this attorney that used ChatGPT and relied completely on ChatGPT acting in a fit and proper and ethical manner as required by law, as required of an attorney? And then now the liability in terms of that out, uh, adverse outcome, how does it fall on that attorney who was irresponsible enough not to double check what they were using? Okay. So I would argue that companies, um, that is the directors, obviously making decisions to use AI and then use the AI content to perform their functions. They have a fiduciary duty towards the company to check that this is in order before, you know, utilizing that content uh, created by AI and going with it without an oversight. Because in terms of the company act, for example, like I said, and a director has a fiduciary duty and if a director makes adverse decisions, they are responsible for the adverse outcomes. So if they do not implement you know, the oversight um, that comes with all these decisions, it would make them liable as they did not act in the best interest of the company, obviously. So like I said before, the duties are then outlined you know, in the Companies Act. So that, that's the kind of legislation that can, uh, we can fall back on which would open the directors up to breach of legislation of duties of director, not forgetting, you know, other laws, like I mentioned earlier, the Poppy Act, um, any adverse outcomes from the Poppy Act or the use of AI to breach that kind of a thing, those kind of things can come into effect. And then I would say that we can maybe place that liability on directors. 
Okay, if you've just joined us, you're on Radio Al Ansar, just gone uh, past 7.30 on a Monday evening. We've been ch- tra- chatting to Nazneen Khan of BPG Attorneys from Pretoria, and we're talking about the legal ramifications and implications of artificial intelligence. Um, the number in the studio, 0861-904-904. The WhatsApp number, 60 904 if you have any questions related to artificial intelligence that you want to post to Nazneen, please feel free to either call us or to WhatsApp us. We're going to go for Nazneen, we're going to go for a short ad break. And sure. when we come back, we'll explore other aspects of the legal ramifications of artificial intelligence. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Radio Al Ansar. It's the Business Matters Program with me, Anwar Mullah. And we're talking to Nazneen Khan of BPG Attorney from Pretoria, and we're talking artificial intelligence and all things legal um, related to artificial intelligence. Nazneen, uh, thanks for staying online. Welcome back to the program. I'm going to start okay. by us. I'm going to start the second part of this program by asking you about the how how are governments and regulatory bodies around the world approaching approaching the regulation of AI technologies. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, the in, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, that's one of the ma- one of the major organizations that are in talks discussing all of this. Um, but if we talk about, you know, the the governments and the regulatory bodies, I think everybody is kind of struggling with the concept because AI is very fast paced. But there are discussions. So for now, I think there's a lot of, um, as far as I understand draft and proposed legislation due to the rapid changing aspect of AI. And nothing actually at the moment is considered set because like we, you know, we talked about in the previous questions that there's various challenges. These need to be tested before legislation is actually, you know, put in place. And even when legislation is put in place, there's obviously going to be some um, challenges that come with implementing that legislation. And then those need to be considered uh, and tested kind of like, you know, when you have a new app and then you have the beta app and the app is tested and then you discover the challenges. Nobody ever buys the first phone or or the first car because these things need to be tested against all the challenges to see if it's workable or if it's working. So a lot of draft legislation around the world, um, a lot of draft regulations, for example, the European Union, um, they have a proposed Artificial Intelligence Act. The USA has an algorithmic act. China has an AI development plan. So if you research, you know, quite a few countries have only, only proposed legislation, but nothing actually set in place. So you can see that all of this is still under work. Um, what they do focus on, though, is all the legal challenges we spoke about right at the beginning of this interview, um, specifically in terms of liability, accountability, uh, protection of data. Protection of data is very important because, you know, with regards to AI, a lot of people are using it for data information processing. So when you process information or data, then, you know, those things are also as far as they're valuable, those things are also um, breach of protection of privacy uh, of a lot of people. So there are though, you know, certain frameworks already in place in some countries to deal with the use of AI. So if you look at Canada, for example, they have uh, something called like a federal directive. So not necessarily legislation, but it's like a directive dealing with the auto decision making because Canada works a lot with AI at the moment. Um, for example, case lines, that's uh, going back to law now. Uh, mm-hmm. Case lines originally came from Canada. So all the attorneys that are listening or anybody who knows and has dealt with case lines, if they've um, had their, you know, their touch with, in, with law, that originally came from Canada. So, you know, they talk about things like the mandate to assess the accountability, uh, the fairness of AI systems, because like we said earlier, again, they, you know, AI can be trained to be biased based on the information that's processed through their systems. Uh, in South Africa, we don't really have anything in place, um, but we can, you know, fall back on things like the Poppy Act, uh, that's the Protection of Personal Information Act. Um, this act is not really taken seriously enough. I know there was a thing some years back when the Poppy Act came out, you know, they said, if you don't send this Facebook message to everybody, you're going to breach the Poppy Act. And then everybody just didn't take it seriously after that. But this act is actually quite serious. And and I think people need to maybe read up on that to know what they what their rights are in terms of 
information, especially when they're using AI in today's time, especially when other people are using the information, you know, to process it through the AI bot. So, you know, especially when you go into, um, you know, every website around the world, um, they have virtual secretaries, you know, and they ask you for your personal information. You're putting your personal information in, but you're not signing a disclaimer that this information can be used. So there's those kind of privacy laws in place because you don't know whether your information is actually safe. And the Poppy Act regulates the state of privacy. Um, and obviously, AI being a data system can then be measured according to you know compliance with this legislation um, currently. So I think that's how the governments and regulatory bodies uh, around the world would be approaching AI. Just the general testing, um, draft legislation uh, until they're ready to to test these challenges. Yeah, if I if I can bring it down to a more practical level, and I mean I can go back to my um, my d days mm -hmm. in university studying law, um, it, a lot of it related to precedent, case history, and we always went back to yeah. case history. And as you mentioned earlier, there've been incidents now where um, AI actually quoted case that's cases that were fictitious and not really. I mean, there. Yeah. But if I, if if we if we you know you you attorneys are on, also under a lot of pressure. You have a lot of work, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, preparing for cases is a long, laborious uh, kind of process. Yeah, it must be very tempting to just uh, type in something and and let AI do all the all the work for you. Um, and not only that, do of it in, in a matter of seconds. Um, so yes. when when you appearing on, on, on you know in a case, would it be quite uh, quite easy to kind of work out if the opposing uh, attorney is actually you know done the work or, or or kind of faffing around a bit and relying on on AI? Would it would it be kind of easy to pick out if if he hasn't really done the the homework that's been required? So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of tests. Or if you've worked with AI quite a bit, you'll you recognize certain things. Now, you know, the Gen Z generation, uh, I would say I'm I'm not a Gen Z, I'm a mm -hmm. millennial, but I mean, I do <laughs> have a lot of, I, I am in touch with technology. Um, uh, look, I don't think AI is a bad thing to use, but I think there needs to be certain uh, limits with regards to ethical considerations. Like AI is, is good if you're trying to do research, but if, like, for example, schools, children are just, you know, asking you to draft them an assignment. So there are certain AI bots that you can input that assignment in and ask it if it was generated by AI and it will. But then on the other hand, if you're using AI as just a base and you say, draft me this contract, it'll draft you a contract. Then you take that contract and you can use it as a base to basically, you know, add on or input uh, because AI is basically going to draft you something according to what they know. They're not going to draft you something specifically designed to your client's needs. Um, for example, maybe, you know, the confidentiality clause, the, the non-closure uh, clause or the, um, you know, the, the different clauses that might apply to a certain industry. They might not have that kind of knowledge. And that's something that the attorney needs to build on. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. But I think the ethical de consideration then comes in um, where if an attorney builds a client, contracts are expensive, right? If you go to an attorney, they're going to charge you for maybe a 20 page contract between five to 10,000 rand because there's a lot of things to consider when going into a contract. Sure. Right. But now, um, yeah, okay, so you can get one for 3,000 rand, but I'm just saying, right? Hmm. Most you pay like is 10,000 rand for a contract. But like I said, that comes with an attorney's expertise. It takes them like five, six, seven, ten hours sometimes to get a contract absolutely fine. And then you're amending that contract. You're sending it to the client. The client sends it back. They don't like something. Um, then you're changing things. You're re researching different laws in their industry in order to be able to cater for their needs, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. But now, say, for example, AI does draft you something really good. Uh, and down the line, AI has become such an expert that you don't actually need to to you know spend those ten hours on a contract. Right. But you charge. How, how does a client ensure that you are spending that ten hours on that contract and you're billing them ten thousand rand, whereas, uh, for example, uh, an attorney's hourly rate is one thousand five hundred, so that becomes twenty five rand a minute. AI can draft you a contract, a basic contract, in under four minutes, like maybe three minutes. That would be like. 75 rand for a contract if AI had to draft it for you. 
but that attorney will charge the client 10000 So I think those are the ethical considerations that come into play there. Sure. And then I, if, you, if, you, if you're if you boiling down to the school level where students are going to be using AI to draft their, their assignments, for example, um, it also takes away the ability to think, um, you know, we, we I was speaking to somebody the other day and we we're talking yeah. about the so-called good old days where we remembered everybody's <laughs> phone numbers and we knew... Yeah. And now I say with, with the phones in our hands, with the cell phones, how many phone numbers do we actually remember? I mean, we we just turn yeah. to the phone. Uh, even people that are close to us, we don't remember their phone numbers any longer. But in the old mm-hmm. days, we used to remember all of that. So the the yeah. ability, the, the brain power is kind of getting diminished because we've been spoiled exactly. with, these, with, these, with, these, with these powerful tools that have been put into our hands. And and I'm I'm afraid that AI too. is yeah. going to do the same thing. It's going to it's going to take away the ability yes. to think. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you know, uh, back in the, uh, from way back when, whenever there was like a movie or whether there there was talk about AI bots taking over the world, um, and you know we humans said no, that'll never happen, and we knew we need to protect ourselves. But we're moving ourselves more and more in that direction instead of using AI to help us do things faster. We're using AI to make ourselves a little bit more stupid, I would think. Um, I think AI needs to be used responsibly. And I think if we talk about legislation or if we talk about you know, different considerations that need to be in place I, uh, to, be regu- to regulate AI, I think those are the things that need to be in place in order not to, to use AI to work with us, not to be above us. Because the, like you said, not just in terms of schools, if you look at candidate attorneys, or if you look at interns that are coming into an internship that need to actually learn something, they're not learning anything if they're drafting their letters on AI or if they're drafting their documents on AI. I mean, it's good that you know technology, but I mean, what are you learning if the computer, of the if you know computers don't exist tomorrow, if the internet shuts down tomorrow, what are you learning? You're not learning anything. Yeah, I mean, we can take it further from attorneys. We take the the medical profession, for example. You know, how far are we mm-hmm. are, are we from the time when uh, you go to visit a doctor, for example, or you have a certain symptoms, and you basically rely on AI to diagnose what your problem is. And and more than that, uh, you may have a, a, a medical profession profession who is not yeah. is not so so sure, and and he he basically gives you an opinion. Based on his uh, a, a putting inputting stuff into AI, so you you going and you are paying for the services of a medical specialist who's actually relying on AI to give you a, 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 an an opinion. It, I mean, it's really scary uh, uh, when we take this and apply it to various fields and factors in life. What really? Yeah. Yes, there's good, but there, there's a lot of harm that can be done. Exactly. Then what what is your degree worth? Yeah. You know, if you know nothing. Yeah. What are you? Are you rather than just input your own symptoms into AI instead of paying a doctor's fee or paying a lawyer's fee or or any other industry? Like, I mean, look at Canva today. You right. can go onto Canva. You don't need a graphics artist to go onto Canva. Graphics artists are also using Canva to That's develop right. yeah. um, adverts and to develop different things. And if you're really good at technology and if you're a Gen Z and you're good at all these things, um, you know, you're just going to go onto Canva and create your own content. So I think, yeah, um, AI bots can be fun, but they also can can take away a lot of jobs. Yeah, we already we're finding in on a practical level, um, industry is now tending to hire people who've gone through a, a three month crash course, for example. Not that there's anything wrong with those courses, but gone through a three month mm-hmm. cash course, learned the basics of something and can apply it on a practical level rather than relying on somebody that's done a three year degree because most of that degree is is theoretical, not applying in the workplace. Yeah. You know, so um you're gonna get more and more of that where people are saying, Well, really, you know, the a lot of what we're learning in theory at the university universities not helping us on a practical level. We have all of these tools, yeah. AI, Canva everything else that we can turn to. So let's do a crash course, three-month crash course, we're good enough. And and firms are going to be hiring more and more of those people because it's cheaper to hire people like that. So Exactly. Yeah. Or 
you're going to find companies, for example, that's already happening all over the world, that's not going to hire secretaries to do anything for them because they have virtual secretaries or AI bots to answer their calls in a more professional manner. And then, you know, you have these smaller companies or even big companies that can afford these very um, highly intelligent AI bots to, you know, create AI bots specifically for their company. And they don't have to deal with things like, you know, COIDA, the CCMA, giving people leave, um, you know, those kind of things. So the benefit of having AI for a company takes out the people aspect. And then what happens is that, you know, one does not need to adhere to things like employee rights or human rights and that type of thing. So they would probably want to try and minimize their workforce because all they need to do is pay for a software. Absolutely. Uh, Nazneen, um, any um, kind of things that you want to add to the discussion before we, we close off the, the program? Um, you know, there's, there's certain things that I may have missed that you want to add on to. Um, I think we've covered most of everything because like we, we discussed, there is really no legislation in effect. We can only talk about the considerations thereof. Um, but if we look at how we are to manage maybe AI in South Africa for now, considering the fact that there's no legislation, what are these legal protections uh, are, that are in place, you know, so that AI systems don't infringe on our personal and privacy rights is firstly, go and look at the Poppy Act, please study the Poppy Act, maybe get someone to do a summary for you, get your yeah, chat GPT to do a summary for you and look at what that means for you so that you know what your privacy um, rights are in terms of that act and what, what you can act on or if, if your rights are being infringed. Because AI systems and people utilize, utilizing AI systems in the industry should ensure that personal data is protected by not putting personal information into AI where it is necessary. For example, attorneys, please do not put personal information into AI. Um, unless the client obviously consents to such measures being uh, in place, you know, to protect this data. The other thing that, you know, people can consider is the Cyber Crimes Act, because uh, this is legislation that could prevent AI from accessing personal data without authorization. And this act, it dictates the protection of personal information. As I just mentioned, implementing measures to protect interception of data, because interception of data has become also quite common with the use of AI and with the use of technology. So that's also quite dangerous. So there's various legislation currently that we can fall back on wholly inadequate, but at least some of the things like, you know, constitutional right to privacy, um, rules and regulations per industry, for example, the attorneys, the Legal Practice Act, um, in terms of the law of privilege, and uh, these kind of things with regard to privacy. So I think those are things that people should actually really consider learning more about with the evolving um, change in society with regards to AI. Yes, and I think on the legal side, as, as I said earlier, a lot of our cases are decided based on precedent, and yet we don't have mm -hmm. much precedent in the AI space. So it's going to be very interesting to see when the, the first cases start coming up and how the the judges yeah. pass their judgment based on, 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 on their yeah. intellect rather think, than on precedent, uh, because case law really does yeah. rely on precedent. I think it's really difficult for now for any court to interpret because even precedents come from the interpretation of legislation. Every every uh, every case will basically rely on a particular type of law that exists in legislation and the interpretation of that. And then the next case law is a precedent on how that law is interpreted. And, you know, as we know, laws are created by the people, for the people. What this means is that laws are made according to morals and standards of people in the jurisdiction that they apply. Um, that is why laws of a country differ from country to country and the values and morals obviously differ. So this AI would have to keep in line with those morals and values because of the diverse environments that they all, um, you know, are involved in. So I think, yeah, case law is going to be very difficult to interpret as well. Uh, if, yeah. if, if it's very basic, maybe, but if it's AI specific uh, and data related, I think it's going to be very difficult until legislation comes into effect. Okay, I've got um, a few responses on WhatsApp here that I'm going to end off with. Uh, um, there's a question that's come in and says, Salams, could you ask the guest for me, to what extent do these le legal frameworks actually protect our information? I'm confident that the three-letter agencies throughout the world constantly use our information without our knowledge and consent. What does she think of this? I'm pretty sure three-letter agencies are always watching and recording everything we do digitally. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also a conspiracy theorist, and I believe that uh, that 
there's a lot of breach of privacy laws that unfortunately in in um, there's nothing we can do to help it. Our phones are constantly listening and these are not permissions that we've actually given it. So it's actually really concerning, but that's not something that we can prove. We've been trying to prove it for a very long time. That is definitely a breach of privacy. And I don't think that as a common person, and I, con I relate myself to being a common person as well, has the capacity to even investigate such a thing. So um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a long shot to be able to investigate those kind of things. The only thing we can really regulate right now yeah, is I think the information we're personally putting into, into these AI bots, so the information that we're giving other people to put into the bots. Um, for now, we can just be conspiracy theorists and maybe have Motorola's and 3310's and <laughs> those kind of things, or maybe just don't put so much of personal information into, um, into online sites. I would say. I've got a I've got an interesting observation that's just come through from a gentleman called Mahmoud. It's quite humorous, actually. And he poses a question to AI, and he says, can I use AI to fight my court case? And there's a long-winded uh, response that AI gives him. Um, you know, interesting question, legal research, document analysis, data visualization, predictive ana analytics, and legal writing assistance. So AI blowing its own trumpet, I think, uh, a little bit there. And uh, yeah, so AI giving you an answer to, to, to that one. Thanks, Mahmoud, for that. Um, and it keeps, says in the end, keep in mind that the legal landscape is constantly evolving mm -hmm. and, and the use of AI in legal proce proceedings may have implications on the admissibility of evidence, privacy, and ethical considerations. Always consult with a qualified legal professional to ensure <laughs> the appropriate use of AI in your case. So even AI <laughs> um, is uh, saying, it does, keep, using a, keep using a legal for its words. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, the, nice one there, Mahmoud. Thanks for sending that through. Nazneen, thanks for being with us. It's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you um, for pleasure. Inshallah. inshallah, we hope to see you in the in the studios when you're down in Durban uh, visiting family at some time. Uh, so please do um, come and uh, pay us a visit and uh, we get you back on the program on some other legal matter. So Nazneen Khan of P BPG Attorneys, lovely chatting to you love thanks for giving up your time and being with us and uh, we wish you it's everything of the very best um in your future Jazakallah so much it was nice being on radio once again thank you so much yes that's that's it for me tonight uh, almost time for the eight o'clock news uh, thanks for being with me once again uh, talking about ai and the legal implications of ai I don't think I'm going to be on the air with you next week again. I'm out traveling again to some other parts of the country. Inshallah, maybe in two weeks' time, I'll be back with you on Radio al Sar on another Business Matches program. Lovely being back in the studio. And I hope it was a very informative and, and lovely program to have presented. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.